Good morning, everyone. And sorry that everybody is here on a Sunday morning. Clearly, I would have liked to be somewhere else as well. But I think when we talk about food processing and we talk about logis logistics and storage, it's something that goes synonymous with it, right? So we are here today to talk about the role that logistics and storage plays in the agro food industry. Because when we talk about processing, when we talk about you know, the end good being delivered to the consumer or right from the farm to the folk, the journey isn't complete without the cogs of logistics and storage moving through it. So for that, I would like to introduce today's panel. Today's panel is going to be moderated by Mr. Vignesh Manogaran, Head of contact, Contract Manufacturing, Way Cool Foods and Products Private Limited. We have Vidya Shah representing Abu Dhabi Food Hub. She is the Chief Commercial Officer. We have Mr. Sharat Longanathan, the co-founder of Ninja Cart. And we have Dr. Neeraj, Professor for Agriculture and Environmental Science Division, Niftam Kundli. All right. So with that, I would like to open the floor to Mr. Vignesh to take this over and set the context for this panel. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Tezun. Um, a warm welcome to the audience and my fellow panelists. Uh, um, maybe I'll start, I'll set a little bit of context into what this storage logistics means and then uh, we'll have a few questions uh, for the panelists and we'll have a discussion. After that, we'll leave the floor open for questions uh, and any discussions from the audience as well. Um, maybe I'll start with some uh, facts about uh, agriculture, right? Um, see, in India, we are actually a very blessed country in multiple ways. Uh, we have almost all 15 of the 15 agroclimatic conditions available in the country. We also have about more than 45 out of 60 soil types which are required for uh, growing of different types of crops. Does anybody know, we, we are, while in land, in terms of land share, we are probably seventh in terms of uh, the size of the country. But that's actually belaying a very important fact. The, globally, the average of arable land uh, out of the total land is about 11 percent. Does anyone, can anyone take a guess what is that percentage for India? The percentage of land which is suitable for agriculture out of the total land area. 40, okay. Any other guesses? Fifty-six. Okay. Okay. One more guess, yeah, maybe, madam. One. Sorry. One third. Okay. Fair enough. I think uh, you. It's range bound between that. It's about fifty-two percent. That's five times the global average. So all this indicates that there is so much which can be uh, produced in this country, which can feed not just our country, which can feed the rest of the world also. But there is also another thing which comes along with it. There's a huge variety in terms of what is produced. And that has led to actually significant variation in the culinary taste across the country. What we eat in one town, maybe one kilometer away or even three, four streets away, you will find the taste very different. All that is great. When we go out, we have, I think many of you would have sampled all the street food from across the country. None of these would be very similar to each other. But then at the back of it, there's a very, very complex pulling of strings which is happening, which is getting all these ingredients reaching the right places at the right time. That is logistics for you in food in uh, India especially, right? And uh, today is a Sunday morning, but this logistics and storage uh, um, sector never sleeps. There's no Independence Day for it. There's no Republic Day for it. There's no holiday for it. We all get ourselves. Can I say, can I have? Yeah, please, please. Uh, we just uh, made a very small ad campaign about Ninja Cart. We rebranded. Uh, you should just have a look at it. Like we have really uh, tried to show what happens in the back end. Not trying to promote Ninja Cart here, but I think uh, we have been hearing some uh, uh, good things about the ad. Uh, it's a three-minute video about what happens. Uh, I mean that gives a very good idea of uh, like to appreciate the people behind the supply chain. Yeah, I, I think it is important to uh, re uh, I mean, remember the efforts which are being put day in and day out in the well supply chain. And even during COVID times, this supply chain has been extremely resilient. I don't think we've had any kind of 
uh, shortages anywhere kind of uh, except in maybe like very very temporary phases kind of thing so uh, all that is possible because of how this logistics and storage solutions work and how, why does this have to be transported everywhere because uh, i'll probably take one more minute just to set this context this is the geography of it right with 52% and all now the history of it is people are very mobile earlier people used to probably like cultivate food around and just have only that but as uh, progress happens people migrate to different places they carry their food habits also along with them not just within the country outside the country also but they want the same food over there how do you get there the problem becomes magnified on another uh, level right so um, uh, i think th th that's the theme behind uh, logistics and storage it's mostly behind the scenes if you look at india about 800 billion dollar is the food industry about 40% of the value addition happens in logistics and storage so it's it's this is post harvest what i'm talking about so it's a significant portion of the value which also implies significant optimization possibilities and wastage reduction possibilities available in this uh, segment so uh, that's the brief about why logistics and storage is important how it has evolved over a period and um, I, I would like to maybe uh, go to each of my panelists. I, um, I, I head of contract manufacturing for way cool foods and products. We are a full stack agri company. We work from the uh, farm to the uh, consumer side. We are a B2B company, one level below before the consumer. We make brand, we have our own brands. We have some technology solutions specifically for agri. We do private labeling and contract manufacturing where others can plug and play and to launch their brands etc and all um, maybe i i would like uh, my co-panelists to take a minute to introduce themselves and any overarching thoughts about the topic i would like them to say maybe we'll start with uh, sharad hey good morning uh, i'm sharad uh, <coughs> uh, so we started in 2015 uh, and uh, we have been known for uh, being a fresh supply chain company but the last two years uh, we have kind of uh, changed uh, not changed but then we have we are doing more than just being a marketplace between uh, farmers and retailers uh, we believe that at every leg so uh, we have this fulfillment business in um, two cities in india but then uh, as uh, vignesh rightly said from farmer there is a source trader uh, from source trader there is a destination demand trader and demand trader to retailer right this, every leg has uh, its own challenges they have uh, there is a problem in uh, how information is uh, dissipated, absorbed, consumed, how, what is the, the price intelligence, right? So we try to, and also market access, where does my produce go when, right? So basically we solve for all these uh, problems in each leg and we have dedicated uh, marketplaces that we have created as Ninja Kisan, Ninja Mandi and Ninja Kirana and also the last whereas we are also focusing on the cross border trade on Ninja Global where Ninja Kart is basically the fulfillment business and we have been going towards uh, marketplaces trying to help trader trade simple right if if finally it's it's trader he wants to either buy or sell so how can i as a company help a trader trade uh, with our tech solutions with our uh, fintech right uh, with the right time credit with information what are possible right how can i make this uh, this this ecosystem much more better we have been uh, looking at it, it for a long time so uh, something has to be done for the unorganized to get organized right so we are in that journey to make um, say better lives for uh, the people behind the supply chain and uh, try to make them do better and, and that's what we are doing with Nish. Making formal the unorganized uh, sector in a way. Uh, I would say uh, so, so generally people are telling that no, hey uh, this, this, is, this is a common thing right yeah. if you just go and say farmer hey I don't want my son to be doing farming right yeah. or if you meet a trader he says hey I don't want to do I don't want my son to do trading I want him to become an engineer or a doctor right so how can so so if, if everybody goes away from this uh, and if this tra if the trading is not done by the best minds right yeah. then uh, we are risking our food on the table no, absolutely I think 18 percent of the GDP <laughs> comes from agriculture it has to be made attractive for people to do it it is, and it is a very valuable contribution to the country. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Sharad. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Neeraj, any thoughts, uh, please? Oh, okay. I'll be a man. Thank you, Vignesh. Uh, my name is Vidya Shah. I'm uh, the Chief Commercial Officer from Abu Dhabi Food Hub. Uh, just to give you a brief context about what Abu Dhabi Food Hub is all about. 
We are a three and a half square kilometers uh, food trade and logistics park. We're building the Middle East's largest and the first dedicated food trade and logistics park. Uh, this is being built as the, again, for the first time in the uh, UAE, there's been a public-private partnership between the, in the food space, right? This is between uh, Abu Dhabi government through Abu Dhabi Ports Group and uh, a private conglomerate called Ghassanabud Group. And uh, we are also collaborating with the world's largest wholesale market, wholesale market for food trade called Aranges International, which is based out in France, right outside Paris. Right? So it's a very collaborative ecosystem that we are building. And what is unique about this is that uh, we are building a one-stop shop ecosystem, which is largely an ecosystem that is going to be trading in all sort of food commodities within a single site. Why is it important? Because you know, we are very blessed as UAE to be at the crossroads of East and West. And our visionary leaders have, uh, you know, sort of proactively built upon the infrastructure that today is one of uh, recognized as one of the most advanced logistics infrastructures globally, right? With this in place, uh, we see that we have an opportunity to connect the East and the West to further globalize the food industry, to further make the global food products available for consumers across every part of the world, right? So that's our key ambition to become a key node for global food supply chains. And uh, as an ecosystem, we are building an integrated ecosystem that combines a wholesale market with a logistics platform, bringing together all the facilitators and enablers, including government authorities, uh, who are you know, responsible for quick, quick and responsive action with regards to customs, facilitation, et cetera. So which is what ultimately makes an efficient trading ecosystem. Uh, so yes, that's a brief context. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you're, uh, what you're saying is, it Abu Dhabi Food Hub is uh, intention is not facilitate trade for UAE alone. It is to facilitate trade cross border east west. Absolutely. Okay. There are two things uh, here. One is the food hub is an integral part of the UAE's food security agenda. So we are very, very well focused in trying to bring global foods, uh, diversifying the foods from, uh, you know, today most of the food that comes into the UAE is largely from the Indian subcontinent or the Middle Eastern countries. And the UAE is very, very uh, focused on bringing, sort of diversifying this base and bringing in the products from different origins. That's being one. And the second, as part of what I earlier spoke about connecting East and West, we are a re-export hub as Understood. well. It's both, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Neeraj, uh, uh, any opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Ignish. Uh, I represent here as part of Academia, uh, Neeraj. I, I'm basically a post-harvest horticulturist working with uh, fruits and vegetables and fresh supply chains. So our aspect is to connect grassroots level with the technology-oriented concern and how we can disrupt the supply chains, especially for fruits and vegetables. So in, in some of our projects, we uh, studied the consumer behavior, how they connect with market. And when we studied uh, a concept related to purchasing behavior of fresh fruits and vegetables in Delhi NCR, we came to know still uh, a mall culture is a little far away rather than people would prefer to have vegetables while going back from offices to home. And uh, fresh Sunday markets or evening markets are more prominent still having a grassroots hold. And in all these things, uh, the supply of quality material, people are getting aware with FSSAI and all other things. So how they understand the freshness and the pesticidal free vegetables and fruits is one very important concern. So quality becomes an important part. So how we can disrupt these supply chains uh, in line with making it more shorter and bringing consumers and producers all together, that is one part where I deal in. And uh, as a part of academic institution, uh, it's, I represent NIFTEM uh, Kundli. And we offer almost all things related to a food ecosystem, starting from NABL accredited lab and certificated uh, testings to academics at each level, BTEC, MTEC, UG and PG courses are there. And research and development with new product development exercises, technology development like that. So that's where I stand in and fit in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that way we have a very uh, diverse panel over here. We have a, a large scale facilitator and a marketplace kind of thing, a large integrated player, and uh, we have academia also. So, I mean, I, I think there will let there be more free flow of ideas this way across actually. Uh, uh, okay, next, uh, see if you look at logistics and storage from what I've heard, uh, we should make it more attractive, we should improve the scale, we should kind of reduce the losses in this, etc. There are multiple stages in the 
uh, supply mm -hmm. chain post harvest till the product reaches the end consumer right for any supply chain to be very uh, um, called as good there are th five six dimensions to it one it especially in food it has to be fast so that the product comes fresher to the end consumer it has to be cost efficient so that it is cost effective food is an essential product it, uh, and then the quality has to be uh, preserved and there are also few more dimensions which have taken uh, which have become Im very important of late one is resilience we are having a lot of uh, crisis uh, something or the other happening every uh, every few months now so it's important that the food supply chain is uh, resilient and is not disturbed by any of these kind of geo um, geographical or um, uh, political events also. So that resilience is another important factor of these things and the environmental footprint also. We are all conscious of uh, the effects of climate change and uh, especially on food. We are still dependent on monsoons and the monsoons play a huge role in determining the six and seven hundred million tons of uh, food output in the country. And uh, not just here, even worldwide, there are changes uh, happening because of the variations in climate. And this is becoming uh, much more prominent in food sector before it affects any other sector. So the uh, green friendliness or uh, how less environmentally loaded the supply chain, that is also important. So these are like five, six uh, dimensions of what the supply chain uh, improvement implies on. Uh, I would just like each of the panelists to probably take a minute to minute or two to describe what kind of challenges they have seen and innovations they have done to overcome it uh, and uh, how do they see this uh, going forward. Maybe you can focus on s highlighting some of the things which you have seen and solved it. Uh, that could give some ideas to the rest also. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll go first because sure, mine is simpler, ahead. right? So, <coughs> so typically uh, we'll, we'll talk about the fresh uh, because we have been uh, building a, a supply chain on the f a fresh food category for the last five to eight years, right? So, uh, once once we entered, right, uh, it was very evidently uh, visible that you don't have a cold supply chain in the country, right? Uh, why not? Because the end uh, retailer uh, who c retails the product, the mass of them do not have refrigerator, right? So. Uh, so thermal shock is something which, which I think Dr. Neeraj can explain, right? Uh, is, is something because of which a majority of the fruits and vegetables start deteriorating faster. Uh, this starts from the moment you actually, um, you harvest the product. And even if in certain products are more sensitive, you harvest it early, late, or if your harvesting method is bad, uh, that also starts uh, uh, decaying or say it, it starts aging the product much faster right and so so basically we we had to kind of go along with uh, non refrigerated supply chain and and we had to uh, three four challenges that immediately came to us was hey uh, then i should time to market right what time i uh, what time does my customer wants the deliveries uh, what time do i uh, start my operations in my warehouse and what time do i go and ensure that harvest happens and the, the the kind of the dispatch happens in a time where it is not too hot it is it's okay for the uh, for the product to just be transported and at what time is the farmer harvesting right and then accordingly give an indent to a farmer uh, usher him a price and all those negotiation happens right so i think uh, on time uh, the planning of each leg uh, was one thing that uh, really helped us uh, second uh, is that you know uh, definitely mm, we had to track where exactly is the quality issue coming from say uh, when you're doing 200 300 tons a day right uh, and uh, a, a lot of crates uh, when, when a lot of uh, producers gets mixed up right and uh, which customer is 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 kind of uh, calling out uh, that quality is bad we had to kind of trace it back hey this came from which village or which batch of produce right and that's where uh, we, it was a need of the art to kind of you know track it trace it and send back the feedback to the farmer or at least highlight hey i think i shouldn't 
put much more stringent uh, quality uh, procedures in a in a few collection centers where uh, the pro the products are not good or might be I should move my procurement area right so RFID is something that uh, that helped us and also we 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 felt that if we touch the produce lesser uh, the effect was uh, better you know so only once when we kind of collect it in collection center it was touched and uh, then it could never it's a one touch supply chain right and it never gets touched we try hard so that it there is no too much of repacking and packing so all the packing gets done and dusted in um, at the collection center and then uh, at finally uh, you now the retailer gets to uh, have it and here you know we move it in crates we don't do packaging because we have to have a kind of a larger load so we have to move it in crates so uh, definitely when you have an empty crates again uh, reverse logistics you yeah reverse we had to plan for reverse logic right. because suddenly one day you don't have crates, crates. to uh, supply to the farmer right and and for that also RFID helped I, th I, I think uh, and majorly in the in, in FCNC uh, there are two major reasons um, people see it as a risky business, uh, definitely perishability, and it's a very laborious task, right, uh, for people to wake up in the odd hours and do all these things, right? So we also had to take that into consideration and make it okay for uh, the blue collar workers to kind of work at FC and we had to optimize for how less laborious we could make and we made some uh, uh, some hardware uh, installations which were not too much tech but then yeah which kind of reduced the life simplifies life. the yeah. life of uh, the people there and I think this is what uh, the major things that we had done to ensure that okay when I when I when I do on time and my customer wants quality at the right price uh, my farmer wants the best price for the yeah. his produce and we need le least amount of wastage yeah. so what we do at each step uh, that contributes to these three four main goals is is, is, is how we kind of solve as and when the problems came to us sure. thank you I think, uh, as Sharad said, just uh, uh, taking it a little further, any supply chain, it is not just the physical movement, it is also the information transmission and also the finance uh, uh, transaction happening. So there, there is innovation needed on each of these three steps. I can, uh, uh, I, I can echo many of the points which he has said. It's a very simple physical solutions like having only crates uh, to transport produce and uh, making sure that we are planning it right so that <laughs> the plant takes good care of the products. So if we harvest it as late as possible and get it as quickly as possible to the consumer, then very little further has to be done. But getting this demand supply matching right is uh, uh, quite, uh, it's not an easy task. But in here, actually, I would like to just leave a thought. There are aggregate, while the individual consumer cannot probably give this demand, there are a uh, lot of aggregate consum consumers like even large caterers, large, uh, the large retail stores, etc. I think at some level, if there is some way of uh, capturing it, uh, these demands and these don't change o very drastically over a period also, that could become useful inputs for many players to kind of plan their uh, work around. That's something for maybe uh, as, a phys as an enabler, this is something you could also kind of uh, look at uh, from the information point of view. How do you enable apart from providing the physical infrastructure? With that, I request you, your thoughts on Absolutely. This. I think yeah. supply chain is just not, not just the physical movement, but yeah. also the financial and the digital movement. Uh, in t I, what, where I would like to touch upon here is, uh, as Sharad spoke a lot about the supply chain within a domestic market point of view. But when it comes to the international trade, we are no more getting crates there, we are getting large containers. I think that's a major difference. right? And uh, a lot of focus has been given on the first mile of logistics and the last mile. But there is something as a mid-mile when it comes to the international trade, right? That is exactly what where we belong to as, in, uh, as Abu Dhabi Food Hub. And in the middle mile, I think the efficiencies uh, are the key factors. And uh, you know, maintaining the temperature integrity, the cold chain integrity of the products becomes a very, very important factor. Uh, one primarily is because uh, most of these products, as for example, when they come to the UAE today, most of the Indian produce, they largely get distributed either within the UAE market or maximum they go until the GCC, although there is a potential to go, grow much beyond that. Uh, one of the key hurdles for us here is that the perishability of these products, the shelf life is very, very short. And in such a case, the, and the today's markets in the UAE do not cater to a complete cold chain integrity management. 
And that is exactly where we are trying to focus on, where the product comes into a temperature control zone and get dispatched, traded and dispatched from, from a temperature control zone. I think that's important. The moment we increase the shelf life of the products, they are able to go much farther to different nations. That's one. And the focus always for us is that we are not looking at what our customers need. It's the customer of customers, right? That's important. For example, when it comes to supermarkets, we need to think of you know, who is ultimately buying, what is the state of the product when it reaches that shelf, and how many days does it stay? So I think that's an area that we are touching upon that ultimately impacts uh, you know, both at the first mile and the last mile ecosystems as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nindaj? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, very beautifully said, Ms. Uh, Vidyati mentioned about some important aspect of technologies and I, I'll just bring it into a connected word. I'll say that we need uh, tech enabled connected supply chains for perishable commodity. Mm. And uh, it, it brings it that uh, even at the farmer's level, how you are able to deal with the volume. Because agriculture raw material is full of diversity and variation. There is no major uh, yard stake at the farm gate level to segregate it, else you go for primary processing. So when you are linking these supply chains, first of all, uh, like the, at the awareness point when the seed selection is done, a uh, farmer must be very clearly available whom he is going to cater the produce that he is going to grow. And that makes the tone right set for the market. In 1970s, the first study that came from FAO talks about your local produce reaches to national or international market the way you have grown it. So if it is preferably a fresh produce for owning a table, it goes to Horeka chain first or domestic markets. And if it is something that is diversified for processing purpose, which has some processable traits, it goes to the processing industry. And that delineates both the distinct aspects of its utilization purpose. And in between, when we handle the volume, the variability first important part. What Sharad said about thermal shock, in scientific terms, we start with the pre-cooling exercise. So bringing the core temperature, because fruits are at different places, vegetables are some sunshine, some on less sunshine areas. So when they are harvested, they are harvested with differential temperatures. So first of all, they need to bring it to the rest. The second important part is when we are trying to build up a supply chain and dealing with volumes and looking for various solutions, we should understand what kind of physiological behavior the produce is catering to. It may be a niche component, but if you study the supply chain logistics, uh, supply chains aspects of DHL, which they specially crafted for mangoes, they are dealing with a produce which can be harvested at a half maturity stage. Uh, it's a non-climactic produce. It is an ethylene-producing produce. It needs management towards ethylene and respiration before it goes to anywhere. So they pack it in a manner that uh, ethylene is not there till it reaches to. And they can produce it with some, like currently India is also supporting these aspects like greening chambers, especially for uh, oranges, uh, ripening chambers for bananas, uniform maturity. So they're harvesting the produce. All these belong to the climacteric, which has an ethylene affinity. And when we talk about the non-climacteric, which ripens on the produce, uh, on the plant itself, and then harvested and taken to a lot. So they need a little different set of care because they are already soft when they are harvested. So these kind of considerations clearly set different tones for different models, although cold chain is required. So when I say about the connected supply chains, so the management starts at farm gate level. Uh, Sharadin, while we were discussing, talking about that we need to go for a very authentic setup for identifying a collection center and the suitability of collection center in terms of a long chain because seasonality is there. So what happens once the setup is there but the produce is not there? So you need to understand that how the viable links can be created to run that collection center in a longer note and you have tech solutions right at the start of harvesting. So you should have some imaging solutions which can quickly assess that this particular farm, having 70 to 80 percent of maturity of the produce, ready for harvesting, quickly taken up, harvested at a particular time of the day when their rest is more, and less energy dependent exercises can be taken, and then it can brought into the uh, supply chain. So that is one very important part where we start from the very inception. And when, as he said also about the traceability, like RFID kind of. So uh, there are supply chains for apples which they have taken in this lot. There was previously an initiative from government that was Fresh and Healthy Enterprises Limited. Correct. 
uh, it was from Container Corporation of India, Indian Railways. And they were uh, dealing in lot of uh, apple trade and they set up the facility in Rai near Kundli. Uh, unfortunately, they have to diversify it for different commodities because it didn't work because farmers were having a different setup of mind for selling it to private contractors. So starting from the farm gate level, your first stage of supply chain comes in. So I'll stick myself to this point right now. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you, Vignesh. Sure. Right, so uh, definitely what, whatever, you know, Vidya and Neeraj uh, said, right? Uh, because you are an uh, integrated stack uh, business doing it, right? Uh, I, have, I have one question uh, from uh, what Neeraj said, right? Uh, compared to whatever information and uh, knowledge and technology that we talk about, uh, how viable and how uh, penetrative it is, like, you know, because we have a lot of irrigation um, technologies and a better way to save water and increase right. produce. But then have you seen in your experience people adopting it? Uh, and are there, and even let's say image sensing works for few products or say large scale thing. I don't think it, it is something that yeah. really works for uh, everything. Um, everything, right? right? So uh, that's answer, but then, I, I, your experience, experience, your experience on, okay, hey, uh, has a technology yeah. and the know-hows reached the Correct. people, Correct. the farmers? Yeah. See, uh, I'll take it in parts, right? So, for example, uh, there are six dimensions of the supply chain. Uh, quality, cost, speed, the uh, resilience, the uh, food safety, and the environmental footprint on this. We have seen uh, uh, concepts working out in this in a viable way. Obviously, we have tried five, six things before we ha uh, hit upon one thing which works. Uh, for example, we have a uh, company in our group called All Fresh. They focus purely on uh, fruits, uh, oranges, Nagpur oranges, Himalayan, um, Himachal apples, Indian peers, etc. So they've actually, uh, Mr. Naresh Java heads this um, organization. So they've actually found a way to manage all these fruits very efficiently and give the right quality with the kind of confirmed sweetness to the end consumer. But this is done for specific set of fruits. As you rightly said, Dr. Neeraj, the solution is very different for each product. Potatoes require darkness, onions require a high amount of uh, ambient light, etc. So the problem has to be solved at uh, our experiences. If we are able to prob solve the problem at a uh, specific commodity level, it kind of helps. And also even within our supply chain, we've been able to reduce the environmental load. Um, if you look at actual figures, close to 22% of our water is actually reused among our distribution uh, centers. And close to kind of 20% of our last mile fleets are now electrified. I think this will keep going up, going uh, now even larger trucks are coming with electrification possibility and all this will go up. And uh, even if you take uh, the solar power itself, the uh, what is used to run the DCs, about 8% um, eight, eight of our electrical consumption is now um, solar powered. And this has been possible because of collaborations also. Wh one of the learning for us has been is that we, are, we have a lot of conviction about it. This is a very complex space. It, it cannot be done by one person. There needs collaboration between companies and between industry, academia uh, as well, industry, academia and enablers also. So Central Warehousing Corporation, we use their facilities. We have put solar power there, but that requires 10 year, 20 year kind of uh, visibility. But we were able to work out an arrangement which kind of works. So from an environmental point of view like that, we have done. On imaging, I think, which both of you touched upon, right? Uh, we have a solution called iGrade. I think this has been in-house developed and it's available on Play Store. This does not solve for fresh products, but for all um, uh, grains and uh, pulses, close to 23 products, the solution is available, where you take, you don't need much infrastructure, you just use your mobile, take a photograph of that, and it will give you the uh, physical characteristics based grade of the product. It will tell you whether it is bold or medium or economy. That, it's like a blood test report. You have something to compare against a, a reference uh, point and basis that, but obviously these are early days. We need more uh, adoption and uh, thing, but early feedback has been so far quite good. And we need, we will, obviously, the, that's the benefit of formalization, right? You, the feedback loop starts working. 
in an informal sector you have only so much capital so much resources to work on now at least if there is feedback it can be worked upon and then we can give another version kind of thing so uh, we have seen successes in these kind of places but uh, these are early days for the sector also in terms of formalizing i think it requires a lot of combined effort as we move forward to kind of make some of these things stick and uh, after 10 years this will become matter of fact there will nothing will be transported without crate because something as simple as using a crate reduces the loss significantly the challenge as you also mentioned is reverse logistics i mean there are solutions to fold the crates and send it but maybe there can be a marketplace for crates so people can just hire crates when they need it drop it off at the point where they are dispatching it somebody will else will use it whenever i need i can pick it up so then you don't need to transport it back Absolutely. that that whole uh, uh, one leg of the transport cost actually kind of comes down but uh, i think this requires some discussion with the logistics players also and um, I'm sure. I would uh, like to pick up on two keywords sure. here. You spoke of collaboration and Dr. Neeraj spoke of the uh, landscape at the farm gate. Right? I think uh, there's a great opportunity for all of us here as panelists and the audience to collaborate the information that is collected, the intelligence at the farm gate, all the way till the mid-mile, you know, the hubs like what we have. And uh, the reason is that when the intelligence comes, if the mid-mile logistics knows what's happening at the production level, what is the kind of waste? Is there a excess production or underproduction? If that reaches the end mile as quickly as possible, then there is a high potential that you know the price setting, demand planning can be done much effectively, and there is much lower wastage during the supply chain itself. Right? I think that benefits the. Uh, we have seen what is happening quite recently across in the field of onions. I think the biggest classic example. Each and every year we see that either there is an underproduction, prices go exorbitantly high. Or there is excess production, the farmers tend to sort of throw it off. But the markets, international markets, do not know about what is happening. It's always a reactive, uh, you know, for what happens is really reactive there. So uh, I'll put it in, in a different manner. In, in one of our study, I'll just make a brief before that. Uh, I comment on this part. Uh, what you said about uh, bringing in the intelligence at the farm gate level. Land fragmentation is one very big issue uh, in terms of volume of production in India. One of my students worked in uh, Maharashtra, specially identifying some aspects of watermelon supply chain. And the results came out that uh, they have a specific notation for area, they had Gunta or something like this. So uh, the price range varies 1 rupee 80 paisa, 2 rupees 40 paisa per kilogram of watermelon from that particular area, from where he is collecting it. And that reaches to Azadpur Mandi in uh, larger trucks and it costs about somewhere about 34 to 40 rupees a kg. That And the price that is being realized. Now it is a four stage supply chain mm -hmm. where he has uh, a person who is a surveyor like a middleman who gets in touch with the aggregator. So he has a margin. And then aggregator brings a small tempo which has a capacity of about 20 to 18 kgs from there then he takes four days to fill up a truck that is about of 18 tons collecting from a particular area and then that truck transits to Azadpur Mandi. So in this we have about four to five stakeholders. So what uh, Sharad has mentioned about and you are also talking about the farm gate intelligence in a more organized manner bringing lesser stakeholders Correct. that holds the key. My simple formula to understand this, if I am having 100 kilograms of a produce, selling it to somebody at 100 rupees per kg price, once I am setting at a first stage of my selling exercise, it goes to 90 kilograms to the next stage, 10% is lost as a post harvest or a handling loss. And that produce I have taken in 100 rupees. Nevertheless, I will not sell it at 100 rupees. I'll try to have an add of 10 rupees margin for myself. So I'm selling 90 kilograms of my produce for 110. And if I reach it to fifth stage, it will be about 80 to 85 or 75 kilograms reaching to about 150 rupees a kg. So that makes a little difference to understand how the pilferage happens to uh, the each stage. So if you have a more organized one, which directly takes it to the first mile and then the intermediate one and so, and it is little niche about understanding the physiology of the crop that like make it more important to reduce these kind of losses. Sure. And there works the intelligence part of bringing IoT in the scene. Sure. So if it is a linked one, your uh, like ITC brought in very initial concepts of having kiosks. 
mm. and realizing the market price they are be, uh, dealing in the produce which is more in durables not in the perishables because their moisture content is less but fruits and vegetables have higher moisture content they have a lesser shelf life so as and when they are handled less probably we have better chances to take it to a longer distance and before i just put uh, this point i'll make one more point that uh, if you study the supply chain of jespri uh, primarily mm. the kiwi fruits uh, it is a self help group of women that takes the lead there in uh, new zealand and that kiwi on per unit price cost comes approximately somewhere between on the basis of size 14 rupees to 18 rupees in exotic azadpur mandi one piece but what comes from our uh, northeastern side is ranging somewhere about 24 to 28 rupees Correct. single piece so when they have an international supply chain and bringing it to indian market at such a price which is more affordable and preferred by the indian consumer because indian consumer at one point of time is played by the price only so you have to have an integrated set to bring up it into a national or international market so Inter when your quality is set right at the initial place probably you understand the dynamics of handling the produce at a later stage and then it reaches to it so you have to bring this into a org uh, organized umbrella it may it take some time but mindset has to be brought into the organized supply chains one one point uh, where you ended with it's a consumer is king and eventually he decides if he what to buy uh, if the jaspri from outside is cheaper he will most probably buy it because that is what uh, i mean he has to manage within his budget w one thing i wanted to uh, ask the panel and take some thoughts this is something we are also grappling with how does uh, this is all from a supply chain point of view we are talking about w what we need to do at the farm gate in terms of information transfer improvement in technology to extend shelf life etc but once the consumer starts asking for something and starts adopting something then there is nothing which can stop that it's an idea which whose time has come and then all these will become mandatory and will necessarily uh, happen but this is a battle we have i'll just leave one uh, uh, experience from our side and then i want the panelists to also share their thoughts on how we can make take this to the consumer and because we believe these are the right things to do but then the consumer also has to share the same thought once he starts sharing that thought then automatically there will be back pressure to make these things happen so for example we one of our businesses is about private labeling and uh, contract manufacturing where um, we have uh, uh, we have fssc 22000 certified uh, units these are like i mean very very high level of uh, compliance in terms of food safety and quality so for example i can't wear this shirt to the unit uh, the unit this button has to be a push button because these buttons can actually like fall off and there will be no pockets in that etc like that them there are some 300 400 points which uh, which are annually audited and these are uh, uh, mandated but then uh, there are people who you can get the same work done in a uh, different location also but there is tangible benefit to the consumer uh, in terms of quality shelf life improvement etc so say you do vacuum packing it will extend the shelf life by 2 months automatically food loss comes down maybe a marginal increase in price etc but uh, how do you make sure and these are all given as services to other brands but the end consumer it's not easy to reach the end consumer you have to go via uh, in via retailer or a, a brand or something if there is a conversation around this which can be started on okay what is the right thing to do it is not about buying from x or y it is about what is best in the interest of the sector in the interest of the country and the interest of the consumer if that happens uh, any ideas on how we can make this happen so yes the consumer should say have you in my cant in your office canteen did the fruits and vegetable delivered to the office come in a crate or not because if it comes in a crate there would not have been much of hygiene issues associated with it it cannot be thrown around just like that etc is it processed in a facility which may which is kind of uh, only um, it it meets a certain standard of uh, processing quality it it is uh, coming through a hub where i have certificates to know how it has kind of gone through the entire supply chain i have visibility into the important points may not we need not beat it to death but at least the key parameters are available if a conversation like that happens from consumers and influential customers maybe there can be something uh, to accelerate this also I, I would love to take some inputs i'll just take a shot at it because uh, uh, vignesh uh, as everybody knows uh, in this room and 
including uh, uh, Vidya, right? So finally, when a deal gets signed, it is like, hey, how much it is, right? How can you, when you say food security, right? Hey, can you get me a kilo cheaper, uh, a rupee cheaper, right? Uh, is the final question, right? So, so uh, when, when, at, 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 when a UAE market, right, uh, which actually has a premium market, right, uh, is pushes so hard on uh, price, uh, what about uh, the large population in India? Right. So definitely it is a big challenge and today, uh, uh, you know, as we see, right, people have started to realize the importance of it and esp especially the, the newer generation uh, as they come into jobs, uh, they have been realizing, they have been seeing. Uh, so I have, I have seen uh, even though the A2 milk is, you know, it's, it's double uh, the price. Uh, there are mothers who specially uh, buy that milk only for the child and they have the normal milk for others, right? And I think that is starting at least for the kids, right? Where people want to at least, and then uh, as the nutrition is a problem, uh, we, are, we are seeing the lifestyle is changing, right? I think uh, the kids where, where they talk about healthy foods is a good start uh, for the industry uh, to kind of you know start inculcating is because I think when they it, when it becomes a norm for them then they start demanding uh, as they grow up, as they, they, grow up they will demand uh, plus one more thing is that see uh, today if, if, if I have to ask you right or anybody in this today what is a good cauliflower right uh, what, what what do you what, what is a good cauliflower I say if we'll just ask you what do you, in your thought in your mind no agri student, by the way, uh, just normal people. If you think what is good, a good cauliflower for you, what it would be, please uh, just answer. What is what is a good cauliflower? When you go to when you go to a shop, why when will you buy that cauliflower? How will you choose a cauliflower? I learned this from my parents. Okay. Anything? <laughs> Anything else? Anybody just? Huh? Yeah, right. So basically, it should be white, no worms, big, <laughs> right? <laughs> no worms is like, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a story, you know, uh, that there is generally uh, when a farmer grows, right, he grows something for himself and he has a farm for supply chain, right? Because cauliflower is supposed to have worms, right? It's good worms, right? But then not something which eats away the worms. I don't know, sir. But then that tells that, okay, it is not too much pesticide in it, right? The more white it is, the more non-yellow it is, uh, the more big it is, you know, that is not what quality is, that is our induced things, right? There are, there are uh, biochemicals in the market uh, where you just go and put a syringe, next day the cabbage becomes double the size, right? So, so, no, I mean, these things are happening because right now the quality is to us is a broad, white, big, uh, like it has to be at this color, this shape, right, uniformity and all those things. But then people, uh, how, what the quality is the nutritional quality, right? So can we start uh, telling people, hey, this comes with a nutritional quality or this has this much pesticide in it, right? Can we bring it? I, I think once we start doing that, but then not at a farm gate level, but at it make it a... Uh, thing for retail, hey, this tomato has this much of lesser pesticide, this tomato has this much of bigger pesticide, larger pesticide, your PPM is higher, okay, this is, comes at a lower price, but at a better, uh, what do you have, higher health risk, this at a lower health risk, might be then people who are healthy will start then appreciating what has gone behind and cultivating the thing and then start paying a premium. Until unless these, the health and uh, the perception of people on quality uh, doesn't change. I think we have a, a, a big hill to uh, climb, and it's, it doesn't look good. Uh, but I think, uh, but I read, but uh, we have to make a start. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think uh, these two ways uh, would really, really help. Uh, Thank you, Sharad. I, I think yeah. the theme is: can we have more conversations around the quality, and I, that will uh, bring awareness. Automatically, people will choose what is the right thing for them. I think that's the theme I pick up. I think it's a very interesting point. We should uh, build on it. Even as practitioners, we should also make our own efforts to uh, make that happen also. Uh, with the uh, consumer point. Of from a consumer yeah. point, you know, looking at the overall supply chain, you know, we have started, done a, uh, 
number of studies around what is happening in terms of international trade, how is the food coming into the UAE. And I'm of the opinion that the price of the product, or the, the, you know, the quality linked and the uh, value addition linked prices don't, do not necessarily have to be always pushed to the consumer. The prices no, don't necessarily have to rise just because it's you know, looking better and improved. But also we need to be working on reducing the inefficiencies in the supply chain. As Dr. Neerad spoke, just before, from Maharashtra all the way until it, before it reaches Azad Purmandi, there are five layers, five intermediaries. And that is a point at which one level, again, there are multiple intermediaries. An international wholesaler buys from there. And then there is an international buyer, aggregator in the UAE who buys from that wholesaler. So before it reaches the end consumer, there are eight or 10 uh, intermediaries who are involved. And the prices keep increasing at every level. I think that is an area we all, I think as digital players, you are also working on the similar uh, aspects. And as Food Hub, we are also working on the similar aspect. How do we enable a direct access for the uh, sellers to the consumers, right? So when we are able to do that, obviously at the farm gate level, at the growing level, they're able to you know, put in information similar to what uh, Sharad spoke about, which is a very, very important aspect, educating the consumers. And we're able to get the product straight to the consumer, so maintaining the quality, keeping the prices at check, and making sure that they're eating the best quality food. Thank yeah. you. So uh, I have a, a small uh, kind of a, a, a side line to it, right? Uh, it is not just removing the uh, the st stakeholders in between or the middlemen, right? There's a lot of value addition they do, right? Be it credit, be it risk. You will not buy until you see the item, right? I, I will not give out my money till I'm sure the, the food is good. You're sitting like... 4,000 kilometers away, right? And how do I trust? How do I uh, pay my money back? And how do, what if he runs away with my money? And the other guy is like, hey, what if he gives away the goods and then he doesn't have money, right? And I have to pay back my trader, my farmer, right? So there's a lot of value addition which happens in the supply chain, right? It, it's, it cannot be see, only seen as purely a lot of people working wherein it is every guy adding margin to it. It's not as simple as that. The way they work, uh, every leg has inefficiencies, uh, right? And uh, that is exactly where there are good players and bad players because this is a very informal sector. Of the um, uh, there is nothing. So uh, today I cannot start, a, say, a, a petroleum refinery, right? Yeah. But I can no mind. I can just open up a vegetable shop, right? There is no barrier barrier of um, entry. Anybody can start, and that's why people play. People who do not know anything just come in uh, and they do not understand the risk of the business. Get in. It's easy to do, right? Uh, but then uh, as they go, they have to cut corners. So there's, a, there's, there's a lot of, uh, and, and that's how it becomes, uh, the, the industry is bad, right? So uh, uh, it, it said, right, so uh, very sad to say, but then there was an Australian uh, exporter. Uh, he said, we have a definition of India. I was like, what? I never do India again, right? That is India for him. Because he's like, I have lost so much money in the market that people don't pay, right? Then, each, then there is some value addition done in terms of risk uh, solution, Right, happening and and that can be solved with keeping the right incentivizing the right players to do their work in a better way finding markers tagging the bad players to go out of the system i think uh, uh, that in that will really make this uh, the whole ecosystem healthy it's the organizing of the intermediary yeah. ecosystem itself yeah. is what is yeah. necessary yeah. Yeah. I, I think efficiency is not about just cutting down the layers yeah. it is also making the layers seamless and also, uh, how do we make sure that one or two exceptions do not shape the, uh, do not color the entire uh, sector? How do we have uh, fallback options and uh, dispute resolution mechanisms so that this can grow as a sector? I think that's the, those are the points I would probably take away from your, uh, and uh, I think we have kind of one hour is over, maybe. One, one last uh, yeah. thing, yeah. right? So, yeah. see, yeah, uh, Japan has an interesting model. Uh, so, uh, they have this north producing uh, a one type of uh, vegetable, and uh, they have sectors only producing that, and uh, they've been able to organize it in such a way. Okay, uh, they're also, uh, you know, I don't know how the the government has managed to kind of convince all the farmers to do sectorally right you know because you can't find that uh, 
uh, thing. I, I'm not able to. I'm, I'm not saying copy paste that yeah. model. It will not work because so we also have this one district, one product uh, kind, kind of thing. So I'm sure there are some districts which have taken it up in a large way, and even the GA tagging in a way is uh, similar to that. So that e-road turmeric or the uh, Uti garlic, coffee or yeah. the, uh, all of these also are. Example. I mean, we'll have to craft our own solution that we, as a country, we've always done our own way of uh, doing things. We will get there, but interesting thought. We should borrow from uh, those aspects. I think we're going in that uh, direction. The, just one point I wanted to also highlight. I think in the last few years, the, um, logistics Im implies infrastructure requirement also. I think we have ourselves observed a significant improvement in logistics thanks to all these road building, etc. The average time tag, we, we normally talk about uh, Vande Bharat and all this from a passenger uh, experience point of view. I can reach there shorter. But for the uh, agri products, it's even more actually or at least equally important because three hours I save off from 10 hours in shipping a product. Uh, nothing further needs to be done. The product is that much 30% more uh, pressure when it uh, reaches there. And we are only seeing that these are only going to improve going forward. Not just the roads, the quality of the roads, the removal of tolls, uh, which is a huge uh, waiting time uh, factor in this. All of this has made uh, life simpler and uh, for the participants in the ecosystem and also improved the speed and uh, uh, re uh, responsiveness of these uh, supply chains. I think with, uh, th there's been tremendous investment in rail as well. I think th these are all, um, uh, and even ports, for example, I think you will probably be the best judge of what's happening on that front. Uh, pr uh, all these are indicators that we are reaching a stage where there will be a, uh, not a, a small delta change, but there can be a drastic change in the way these models can actually kind of work out. <laughs> Even from a taxation point of view, GST, etc., these are all enabled kind of cross-border trade. Uh, in a way, Europe, uh, because of the seamless nature of the transactions between the different countries, is able to um, bargain better, is able to have more seamless transactions, reduce the cost of logistics, all of this. I, I think we are on that uh, trajectory is what I feel. Any thoughts on the macro infrastructure related to the logistics? Uh, I, I definitely, uh, uh, personally speaking, yes, it has uh, definitely improved from where we are. It has given more access. But I think uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about the cross-border uh, sure. trade here. Right? Sure. Here is where a lot of nations have to come together to work on it. Infra at ports are improving, but then we have a long way to go because if we if we if we aim to be uh, the exporter uh, of uh, the food basket for the world, then I think our ports needs a lot of works to be done. Uh, right. Uh, the clearance, uh, the how a container is, uh, is done, right? The infra. It, I think I think uh, few ports are good. Few ports have a lot of uh, improvements to do. I think uh, the government is looking into it. But then, yeah, we are yet not there. You see, for example, say uh, UAE, right? In Dubai, one of the biggest problem. Nobody wants to ship to Saudi. Even Saudi is a bigger market. Uh, it goes to Dubai, and then from there it goes to Saudi, just because Saudi has uh, 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 it, it has a, a longer uh, clearance uh, period than Dubai. Dubai, it's like it, it, it happens faster, right? So these are certain things that we have to copy focus faster and you know get it seamless, get it digital, sure. make it very, very easy for people to take, remove and then uh, redo things right. Which today I have to look at and I, I have to look at an agent uh, and it's a black box. What comes to me invoice is a black box, right? I do not know what is what because hey, uh, there are too many uh, people coordinating even that clearance. But I think that again is something which has to improve. But then uh, definitely in, in terms of uh, uh, the domestic uh, roads and infra, they are improving, and I think uh, we, we should we should keep doing it, and uh, we'll do good things there. Sure. Uh with that, maybe we'll open the floor to the audience for, to engage. We have about eight minutes. Uh, please, you can ask your questions. So, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the interaction. My name is Yusuf. I am part of the Sun Group, as well as my colleagues sitting there. We've had uh, three very interesting days that we've been here. Uh, I, I, I want to do a comparison of, uh, from a country perspective. The Netherlands, which is about 1.25% of the land of India, exports 50 billion 
worth of food, and we do, as India, 50 billion worth of food uh, exports. I think that was the 22 number. Um, and that's where I see the logistics and production, uh, uh, you know, the, the line between logistics and production changing. We are not moving to uh, farming, which is logistics-driven farming, meaning going vertical or getting higher yields. And we have a lot of produce, uh, which we can do, given that we have 52% of arable land. Correct. If we start going vertical or improve the yield, we will uh, we'll get there faster. And then we will really be able to serve at least the south-south markets, because the near markets. And I'm asking with a very vested interest. I sit in the UAE. We import 92% of our food. If India does well on its agri-production, we have no problems at all. I know my children are going to get fed. But if India does not do well, then the whole world gets concerned. So whenever we've had the rice ban that came in, for whatever reason, the avian flu ban which came on poultry and eggs, you know, that brought in a change in the price of uh, uh, poultry dramatically. It's three folds of what it used to be when India used to export. Or when the wheat ban came in, or the flour ban, and now the sugar ban. These bans continue, but uh, you know, whenever else. So I, I think I, I want to hear from you what your thoughts are on when is this line going to sort of change to be equivalent to what a country like the Netherlands does? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I take it. I, I think. Uh, um, see, uh, comparing Netherlands, uh, Netherlands is a big hub for these uh, products. It is also a transshipment point as well. I am not sure if all of that is necessarily grown in uh, Netherlands also. Having said that, phenomenal amount of standardization they have done uh, in each of these products. Uh, each of these product supply chains, they have kind of uh, formalized and they are able to have solutions which are much, much uh, uh, technologically advanced. Uh, we will have to craft our own solution. We are very fragmented, as Dr. Neeraj also mentioned. Our consumer demand is extremely fragmented, and our um, farm holding is also, there's a big proportion towards marginal farmers. So we'll need to have suitable solutions for this. The same thing may not necessarily work. We don't have like 100 acres with one farmer on average. We have probably like two, three acres with one farmer on average. I, I'm, so. It, uh, I, I think the pro emphasis is on how do we make this seamless, as we discussed. How does this 6 to 12 levels of transaction, how can each be made faster, seamless, and more efficient? If that happens, that wastage will come down. This also weaves into the next point in terms of why do these bands come in place? Because if there is a significant impact on pricing, on inflation in the country, there is, there is a certain priority that the country has and uh, but uh, it is not in anybody's interest as you said but I am sure there are discussions I mean it is not for us to kind of uh, decide but I am sure there are discussions happening on how do we minimize these and eliminate these over a period of time so that there is stability more stability will imply more business for everybody and that can improve uh, imply innovation as well Maybe new names. Uh, I, th I think uh, definitely innovation technology I think uh, also the national governments right the way they look at it, right? Uh, we want to be liberal when it comes to our own nation, but then secure our interest when it comes to food security. When, when, we, when we want to be a food basket, I think uh, uh, the, con the how two countries get an agreement done when it is, it, when it, it's my commitment as my nation to kind of offer food to every individual, every citizen in the country. But then when, especially when food uh, trades are done, if uh, that is seen as, hey, uh, that is something, uh, it, they, some countries depend upon me. I think at, at much more at a policy level, I think a lot has to change uh, if, if, if this, that has to be no, but streamlined. I, I mean, the points I made were, were to support my core question. And my core question, maybe I think uh, Dr. Neeraj also would be able to throw some light on it, is the, the, where logistics and production meet, where you take your production yields higher and therefore automatically improve your uh, logistics. There are five yields. I, I was at a farm just uh, three months ago, uh, four months ago, at, at a, farm, a vertical farm in the Netherlands. They, they have five yields in a, five seasons under their, uh, their box. And that box is a logistics box. It's not a farm. 
So I, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. That, you know, you you sort of you have to produce Sorry. more. This country is going to consume more. We are we are now 1.4 billion. Uh, if uh, God willing, we will be 1.5 billion. Uh, Let me take soon. a shot at it as well, <laughs> right? I think one of the key differences between Netherlands and uh, India is the uh, income levels itself. Like as uh, Vignesh also mentioned, the size of farmlands are lower, so the income levels are also lower. Uh, Netherlands, well, it stands at about 30,000 US dollars annual uh, per capita income. India still stands at about three to 4,000. So I think there is a great investment that is required in going urban, uh, getting into the vertical farmings and the urban uh, farming uh, platforms versus the traditional. I think that investment is something that really needs to go up in India for India to transform from a traditional uh, farming country into a more urban farming country. Like, the viability, right? I was coming yeah. to that point. So viability, right? Economic viability, right? Hey, does this investment make sense for me? Uh, I think when the, the farmland are scat scattered and uh, they, so how, how, what decision does a, f a producer take today, right? So b before investing today, he chooses his product. Right. Hey, my my neighbor put uh, tomato. He got a better price. Let me put tomato. Is a decision today they take. Uh, how uh, how informed decisions they take uh, is 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 basic level problem, right? And once then they start uh, viable production of the the produce is the second part of it, right? How they choose what to produce second and 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 how much to produce uh, and if i can invest in more for example let's say uh, grapes is is a very big uh, example in india right if you just uh, take uh, grapes what do you call it? your uh, uh, nashik region uh, in that belt right we did not have grapes say uh, let's say it did not have a to this level say 20 30 years ago but then uh, the kind of changes they have made we have larger farms uh, we have higher production uh, grapes is a very good example how uh, a, a particular region came together and then made uh, uh, you know whatever we found in academia got translated into the field and then it was done right so i see really uh, it worked out for grapes uh, right, but will it work work out for every category that we do into with uh, with uh, with so, so much of uh, say fragmented farms, uh, poor decision making, and then no 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 confirmation or no affirmation of economic viability. I think once and we are very smart. India Indians are the smartest I've seen. Right, they take decision faster if they see economic viability. Right, uh, we need not discuss. It will happen. So because I've I've seen uh, people quickly. Uh, we, we think farmers uh, do not have access to tech, but then they are in WhatsApp groups, you know, they, they, there are, there are uh, dissipation of, not, they know that, hey, th do a ticket in this. They, they know, they don't do it by themselves, but then there is somebody who says, hey, do my ticket here, right? So they, we, w once they see there is benefit, once they see there is economic viability, and they quickly adapt to it. But I think the economic viability of those technologies are not proven we yet for, the Indian uh, producers as such, and especially in the fresh produce, and think that is what is uh, the blocker. The moment there is some incentive and they, they see some benefit in it, might be, it will it'll, it'll pick up. Maybe it's an important topic, maybe we'll can reserve it for... Uh, I just yeah. would no, like to make up two points. Yeah. No, yeah. no problem. After this, we'll take a couple of more questions. Sure. I'll not take much, but I'll, I'll put it that way, that India in around 2000 started the Golden Revolution that was primarily diversifying from the crop base and bringing horticulture produce into the mainstream for production and asking farmers to come up with some area dedicated to the vegetable and fruit production only so that it diversifies the income base. Uh, I put the discussion in a different format, uh, bringing in that affordability and awareness in the scene right now. What uh, Sharad said about like viability, I said this affordability of the technology. The viability of technology comes with some volume of production or maybe the investment side. But how much we are able to make it affordable and along with TND, like training and development part of the farmers. I have seen the drip irrigation in the farmers, uh, like some of them are doing it very good, which forms approximately 15% of the total base where two, three are innovators and then the bell shape curve starts coming in and then the progressive farmers comes into. But most of the farmers, they use the drip irrigation lanes as netting the cot. Char pai ke andar usko laga ke unho ne strong hai, majboot hai, usko use kiya or they use it for raising grape vines or maybe vines like Loki Tori ki ya Tinda usko lagane ke liye use kiya. So because after some time the cloggers started, uh, like drippers started clogging and nobody told them how to declog it. 
that is where the backward linkages for any technology transfers comes into. Even if the affordability and subsidy comes into, a farmer needs to be empowered that how execute, uh, exactly he executes and accepts the technology. So that is one part. And the second part that I say that uh, like uh, the concerned part of Netherlands and India, they, they are more organized in terms of like putting up plant factories. The concept of plant factories, this is production factories is still not there in India. You talk about Japan, they they kunka kuch river hai, uske pas unhone pura factory jo thermally insulated area hai. And they are producing 24 by 7 uh, and 365 uh, days in a year. They are continuously producing a same crop and they are packing it right then and there itself. So that kind of automated control in putting up the infrastructure for this is still not there. Greenhouse, polyhouses became very popular and Indo-Israel projects brought into many centers of excellence. But after every third year, the polythene needs a replacement. And many farmers who are not able to take it to the price because price fluctuation, where they will take the produce when a Shimla Mirch comes into from mm -hmm. a colored capsicum probably, it comes 80 rupees a piece. If you like any retail store, Reliance Sky, you will find it varying from 80 rupees or so. So, where we buy 1 kilo Shimla Mirch, like mindset is different for the consumers also. So, that makes it little different for the farmers because farmer is also producing in terms of volumes and talking about volume because he is train to produce volumes and sell it into the market. Usko abhi ye nahi itna awareness hai ki mein kiyon kiske liye kar raha hon. The same point comes in, in line with. So the technology transfer needs to be in a very organized and farmer once get a assured buyback market. Like many, many companies like Del Monte, they are doing it, Field Fresh, they are doing it. Where they're training the farmers and giving them uh, Jan irrigation since one big group that is working in these lines and they have white onion uh, exporting to Dubai and UAE market. Like even they have processed it, value added to powder and uh, things are coming. So they have a complete set solution for the, it promotes monocropping because same, but that monocropping is coming in artificial note. They are not using it on soil, they are artificial media. So they can replace it, they can sterilize it, but soil can't be done longer and for these things. So these kind of tech enabled solutions are still a, a, a long way that need, we need to bring into. And once the concept comes into, for example, I'm trying in my institution to bring in a small growth chamber. That is a veggie star kind of concept. It's coming from Savir Biotech. It's a plant enabled uh, hydrophonic solution with artificial lightning system. It single unit four layered costs about five, 4.99 lakhs rupees. The first question that came to me as from my administration was, why you want to bring this thing when you can grow it in a poly house? What is the relevance to it? And what kind of crops you bring into? I'll say leafy breath. Who takes thyme here in India? Who takes basil into India? What is the exact production levels? So as a research institution, I am dealing with these questions. So we understand these are interlinked. So if a solution does not reach us to a grassroots level with full package and the farmer is not enabled to get it trained, and once it he produces, who is the taker of that produce? So this channel at a forward linkage, at a backward linkage, needs to be established in peri-urban and suburban areas. Urban area is aware, peri-urban is half aware, suburban still needs. So the extension network comes into the scene. Uh, we work with a lot of farmers. I am leading a program in campus, which is village awareness program. And we take our students to the rural youth and farmers to meet it. Uh, and one of the important challenge that last 12 years we are facing the only one question. Sab bana to hum denge, bechonge kaise? Whom should we sell? How should we sell? How we should place the margin of like, hum kitna bana ke kitna bechenge? I can standardize. And when you will go to like, we work with a tomato farmers in Madhya Pradesh and there was like, we wanted some industry to take the produce like backward linkage create. Karne. And, and they said that if you are producing a puree from this particular technology only, we will take your produce mm. and we'll use it for our processed product. And the technology, our have budget was somewhere about 25 lakh rupees. And the technology they proposed was somewhere about three crores, uh, putting a continuous line where no human intervention is there. So project could not take a back. Viability. Viability. Yeah. So affordability, awareness, viability. these are two important yeah. aspects. So I, I keep this discussion till here only, uh, because you have to strengthen the backward linkages before you t tie up for any intermediary. So the, when the clarity of thought is there, where my produce will go and how it will be taken to the market, the farmer has a surety for getting money. And any technology will have acceptability if it has consumers. So like consumer is a king. So if consumer starts accepting, they start eating lettuce. 
for me, an introduction to lettuce is only that it is a sliced leaf which is present over a McDonald's or a burger kind of product only. Yeah. So it has to be that way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Gentleman in the back. My name is Alhad. I handle the fresh business for uh, Flipkart. Uh, something very uh, inquisitive for now is onion. Uh, the consumption elasticity, say, is probably 0.5 to 1.5x. The production elasticity, Vidya, is also not that great. In the sense, it's not the range is not that higher. But the selling price elasticity is, say, from 1 to 50x. Uh, it happens year to year. Uh, a lot of answer stands in storage. Uh, the topic itself is storage, but we still don't, don't do that. I mean, organizations like us also cannot, because greater than 50 tons, government says, you don't even have to store. And we end up buying at a higher price, it's also selling at a higher price. All government does, uh, ban exports, uh, probably through several, some amount is put into the market, but that doesn't control to a significant extent. Uh, storage of this long term definitely is a solve. Buying at the right time is definitely easy to solve. But as an industry, we fail to do that. Uh, considering Agritech has so much of investment which has come in, uh, Ninja Card to Way Cool, but we still don't do as an organization, uh, including us. So what's your long-term view on that? I mean, even a product like Onion can also not be handled, uh, something strange. Uh, no, I, I think there are lots of efforts. In fact, uh, uh, government has recently launched an Onion storage challenge, etc. Um, having said that, even from a practitioner's point of view, we have actually stored onions year on year and uh, we have learned through the process. There are uh, issues in that we have not foreseen and uh, but over a period we have been able to do it. But the scale of the country is immense. Uh, it is not possible, I mean however large uh, uh, any company is in this space, it is only a minuscule proportion of the three. Onion is 15% of the vegetable production, which is about 200 million tons. 15% of 200 million tons is, uh, I mean, 30 million tons. I, it's huge. These are not, these are phenomenal numbers, right? So, uh, it, it requires also. I mean, I would we would be happy to work with you offline and then get into contracts where we can actually like. Uh, I'm not saying it in jest, uh, where we can actually store it for you and work together to actually like make sure that it is coming at the same price. But even if the price is going down, it should be, that needs to be, on, not, not with you, I'm saying, these are the kind of uh, conversations and contracts which are needed between industry and within industry also between different players for some of these to work. I, I am actually, uh, I have seen improvements in this. For example, we even have a sensor which can detect that ethylene rot. And the moment ethylene rot some, starts somewhere, if you are able to immediately go and remove those onions, it will reduce the spoilage of the remaining onions. So I have seen technologies uh, which are workable and uh, are giving results, but has it been done at scale? No, not yet, given the scale is immense, but it is good that you are asking a question from, um, you are handling a large portfolio as well. You would be happy to kind of, uh, uh, I mean, as a company I am saying, but uh, I am sure as a sector also we will be happy to uh, work as well. Yeah, right. So who holds the risk, yeah. right? So uh, even the the buy side or the sell side, when when you 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 run Flipkart, I run Ninja Cart, right? So when we talk, it's like, hey, uh, this is your risk, right? So and like, hey, I'm gonna put in all my money, and whether it's gonna fetch the same, it's the same question that that trickles down and rightly pointed out, it is a huge, huge uh, volumes that you're talking about. Uh, any one company. Uh, will not be kind of have an industry level impact until unless both like all the legs come together on the same notion right when 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 the, when the consumer does finally he pays for that uh, even though if it is lower or lesser he pays for it right when they're not really uh, discount hunting and every leg with, there can be certain uh, things in place but then what we see is any any point any table there is there is a hey, one rupee less or 50 cent less is what is the talk right then 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 we are just wanting somebody else to uh, take the take the risk you know and and that does that never works right it's it's uh, distribution, distribution. Can be done in a fair, equitable way and honored. I, th I think many solutions can actually emerge. It is well, everybody, right? Not, e not uh, because yeah, yeah, we yeah, should yeah. not be the only people in the market doing it, right? The market should follow Across, it, yeah. right? Yeah. At least start somewhere with three, yeah. four people working. Together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the international front, uh, at Abu Dhabi Food Hub, we are actually building a. <coughs> 
huge capacity. In fact, we are in discussions with regards to onions itself, where they do understand that the onions can be stored for a slightly longer period, and we are purpose building the facilities to cater to that temperature that, that is required for a long term and uh, you know, large scale storage of onions. In fact, if you had seen, while there was a severe crunch in the uh, Indian market, farmers were throwing away onions, uh, there was a severe lack of supply in the European markets, right? Because of the heavy flooding in the key markets for Europe was the uh, Moroccan and the uh, North African markets where the supply was restricted. So I think the product was not able to reach from India to the uh, European markets. And this was lack of this, you know, sort of, sort of, I would call it an offshore hub, which can quickly be responsive to such kind of needs which are global in nature. I think that is where uh, all of us here sitting, as well as the uh, participants, need to collaborate together to understand, okay, what, where are the needs, where is the infrastructure need particularly, and the trade facilitators across the world, including ourselves, are able to cater to it in some of the other forms, uh, right? Can you just add, uh, yeah. by the way, the Netherlands was the one that supported Europe's onions. They had warehouses where they are storing onions, which you can stay for six to five days. So yeah. So it's very much possible. Now we are happy to, if there is any specific uh, requirement that you've got, we are happy to address that. Anyone else? One more question, maybe. I think we are eating into break time. We don't want to. Um. Okay, in that case. Uh, I just I want to bring up uh, one to topic here. I think with, this is largely to do with the market access. Uh, one of the shareholders of our company is uh, uh, you know, Gasana Booth Group, which also owns a chain of supermarkets called Grandios, which is the premium chain of supermarkets in the UAE. And the biggest challenge that uh, we face is that lack of choice of products available. You know, typically the supermarkets tend to buy products from the local market, they don't want to import, but by doing that they're not able to increase the assortment, cannot differentiate themselves from other supermarkets around the lane. And when they want to import, they don't know the quality that is available. They don't know, they, they want to experience the product as uh, Dr. Neerad said. They want to see what they are going to buy. And this is where I think it's important uh, to be part of the offshore hubs of the wholesale markets internationally. So that forms a key part of the market access for the Indian exports, as well as the availability locally increases the, I would say, op opportunities itself, right? The local players are able to look at multiple products. I think this is a communication yeah. uh, problem, I guess, because the amount of variety is significantly high in India. We love to, we would love to connect with you and see how we can yeah. actually uh, solve that for you. Right. Uh, World Food India, for the first time, yeah. I have seen some yeah. of the products yeah. which I have never seen before. Yeah. There is there is so much of variety, yeah, like so I much of find it varieties of staples. Absolutely. So I, I'm. Uh, we should. Uh, you know, we'll connect offline and we can uh, see uh, how. You Simple thing like snacks and the uh, confectionery items. What we see there is a typical Mars or Snickers, or, you know, the international brands. But we never see the artisanal products from India, artisanal products from the rest of the world, which is our key aspect of diversifying. But these products don't come because but this know, is good. there is now a lack. consumer is asking for variety and Yes, we want the, the variety, the but it's not available. I One of the challenges is the market accessibility, right? There are a lot of restrictions in market accessibility when it comes to product listing into a country. Uh, you know, they're paying the listing fees for the retailers the inspections with the authorities. I think one that is one of the areas we also recognize is a challenge for the medium to small enterprises. And we are working closely with the government to so, sort of take that into a control. We should be able to help our customers, you know, uh, do all of those processes and get the products. Because the consumers in the region actually want the Indian products, want the global products to come in. And if I may add, yeah. uh, you know, some of these uh, large companies like yourselves can actually help some of the uh, MSMEs here because uh, one of the areas of concerns that we have, and you know, I'm part of the same group, is uh, the quality of packaging. We see very co poor quality packaging coming from Indian products, which sort of does not allow us to position the products as premium products. Of course, here we had the opportunity of meeting some Indian companies which are doing very well on, the, on that front also. The product is good, packaging is good, and they are able to you know, showcase their products well. Uh, but you can actually help them so that you can, t you know, improve their packaging and we are able to take them, because we can take them not just to the UAE, we can take them to the in other international markets around in the surrounding sure. region. So we'll take that uh, feedback as a sector and we'll work on that. And many may be aware here that, uh, you know, 
the UAE is largely known for the as an aggregation point. You know, many may be aware, some may not be. For those who are not, you know, a lot of buyers from the African, CIS, Middle Eastern countries come to UAE just to find different assortment of products. They're able to just take one FCL container out, which is not possible otherwise. For example, I'll take an, uh, you know, textile is a very classic example. Uh, a lot of African buyers are not a, cannot afford to get a whole container load of product. Hence, they come to the UAE to say, okay, one roll of a textile, one roll of carton of tissues, many other products, they aggregate and bring it together. And that is what also happens within the food sector. I think that is an area that the Indian industry can take advantage of to sort of increase the market access, you know, to the new, newer set of buyers. Thank you. Uh Thank the panelists for a very engaging, uh, not just the panelists, the audience also for a very, very engaging discussion. I think how we could connect the consumer to the uh, producer through the logistics, what is needed from a consumer awareness point of view, how do we respond to that better, make each leg efficient, how do we make the technology appropriate and adopt it for the Indian context and some of the current issues also came up during the discussions. I think. These, uh, it's a good conversation. I enjoyed um, moderating it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.